Um, thank you to the organizers for putting together this weekend and to you all for coming. Freelancers came and went over the 36 years that life was published weekly, with only a fraction of photographers hired as part of the magazine staff. And as this image demonstrates, only a small fraction of these staff photographers were women at any given time. This rare group portrait of life staff photographers was taken in 1960, and it's rare because the photographers were typically off traveling the world on their respective assignments. The woman closest to the center of the image is Margaret Burke White, and Nina Lean is the woman closer to the left side of the image. Born in Russia, Nina Lean studied painting in Berlin before moving to America in 1939, and she claimed to have known nothing of photography when she began wandering the Bronx Zoo with a Rolleiflex that same year. She later told Life's editors, quote, I didn't know anything about taking pictures, so I just followed the instructions on the back of the camera. Lean's voyage to New York was timely, as photography agencies inclined to hire emigre photographers had already been established in New York. And immediately after arriving in New York, Lean found work through PIX, an agency that, much like Black Star, relied on a German emigre network. Though Lean's position was not characteristic of the typical 1940s woman or of the average World War II refugee, her journey was not entirely unique. Alfred Eisenstadt and Fritz Goro, for example, followed similar trajectories to Lean's, from emigration to agency and eventually to contracts with Life magazine. Lean's photographs made their first appearance um, in life on April 1st, 1940, whereas Lean's first life credit that was not followed by the word PIX was published on May 7th, 1945. In other words, Life used Lean's PIX photographs for five years before deciding the magazine would be better off with her name on its roster. Lean worked for Life for 32 years until 1972 when the magazine's weekly editions were discontinued and television fostered the demise of general news magazines. And by the end of her time at the magazine, Lean's photographs were featured on 48 covers and she produced 37 photographic essays. Lean's photography is multifarious, encompassing everything from architecture and entertainers to local politics and faraway royalty although the vast majority of the assignments um, that she created were soft news stories, which covered topics such as entertainment, fashion, lifestyle, and the arts. The number of Lean's images published in life between 1940 and 1972, when considered alongside the magazine's immense readership, is testament to the impact that her photographs had on the American public. An estimated 26 million individuals read the magazine each week in 1953 alone, for example. One of her most iconic photographs, which depicted a traditional American farming family, was also featured in Edward Steichen's 1955 exhibition, The Family of Man, at the Museum of Modern Art, and it was also sent to space on NASA's Voyager Golden Record in 1977. And yet her once notable uh, professional recognition has since been eroded. And this anomaly is the reason I sought to understand her exclusion from the history of photojournalism and its canon. Even with the help of her arts education and the circumstances of the publishing world, Lean's gender meant that she found her way into life during a narrow window of opportunity. Following the country's widespread post-war return to traditional values and gender roles, many women previously working in industrial jobs were replaced by men returning home from war. Historian Elaine Tyler May hails this newfound attitude of the 1950s as domestic containment, with home, marriage, and parenthood acting as a safeguard and thereby answering, quote, Americans' intense need to feel liberated from the past and secure in the future. For women who did work outside the home, many found themselves in substandard pink collar roles such as nursing or teaching. And even life stopped hiring women as staff photographers after 1951. Margaret Burke White was technically the last woman to receive a staff contract on January, 9th, on January 1st, 1951, after working under an all rights contract since 1936. 
Other women would be hired to create photographs for life over the next two decades, but only in precarious freelance or contract arrangements and not as staff photographers. And timing aside for a magazine that would hire only 101 staff photographers over 36 years, being selected to join this cohort was more than a mere honor. And what makes Lean's inclusion in this roster all the more impressive is the fact that of these 101 photographers, only six were women. Unsurprisingly, gender affected more than just the hiring practices at Life. When asked by fellow Life photographer John Lowengard if her gender allowed her to take photographs that men could not, Lean responded by referencing her 1944 photographic essay, Teenage Girls. Lean began by citing her ability to befriend her subjects as a strength before adding, quote, if a man had been there in my place with the same approach, they might have been just as happy. Lean did not subscribe to an essentialist theory of gender. She acknowledged that men and women were treated differently, but she denied that her images were inherently affected by, their, by her gender alone. In her introduction to tender violence, domestic visions in an age of US imperialism, Laura Wexler prefaced her first study of the her study of the first American women photojournalists by evoking, quote, the need for a non-essentialist theory of gender that integrates race and class within the history of photojournalism. And following Wexler's counsel, my own inquiry seeks to avoid assumptions that directly connect Lean's gender to the contents of her photographs. Rather, one cause for Lean's waning reputation can be located in the gendered ways in which life, life's executives marketed her. Life exercised power in shaping Lean's public persona, specifically through the promotion of her career as anything but a heroic and globe-trotting photojournalist. According to Bethy Wilson's observations regarding Life's public treatment of its staff photographers, Lean's circumstances were anything but ordinary. Wilson says, Quote, other photographers had to be satisfied with receiving their credit in a difficult to read block of type hidden near the bottom of the masthead or front matter set in minuscule type. Only a handful of photographers received this sort of prominent play. And by prominent play, Wilson refers to life's pictures, an item found in the magazine's table of contents, which highlights a single, photographer's, a single photographer and their adventures in picture taking by way of a paragraph of text accompanied by a portrait. This was one venue by which life could showcase its exceptional staff photographers to its readers. Robert Kappa, Margaret Burke White, and W. Eugene Smith were featured frequently, and Lean's repeated appearances demonstrate her elevated status at the magazine. Here we can see Lean's Life's Pictures feature from August 20th, 1945, three months after being offered a contract with the magazine. The text begins, Nina Lean, who photographed the house fixing party, has two deep and lasting interests, photography and getting suntanned. Rather than discuss her thoughts on women replacing male workers during the war, the subject of her, of her story and the issue, Life's editors opted to use the allotted 12 lines of text to foreground Lean's femininity and a stereotypically female interest of hers. Lean was again spotlighted in Life's Pictures in 1946 in the same issue as her 11-page photographic essay, The North Shore Long Island. Once more, Life's editors mention her propensity for sun worshiping, this time writing, quote, although she lost part of a beautiful suntan during this assignment, Miss Lean enjoyed Long Island. In contrast, Life's editors referred to Burke White in the August 11th, 1941 Life's Pictures feature as a photo master who triumphantly had access to Russian circles which few foreigners ever attain. Compared to Burke White, who is presented as gallant and globetrotting, the particular rhetoric used to market Lean was often less complimentary, with the magazine emphasizing Lean's gender in a blithe and humorous manner. Wilson asserts that, quote, Burke White's star status shone brighter because of and not despite her gender. And yet the opposite can be said of Lean, about whom Life painted a feminized, almost farcical portrait. Life fashioned a dichotomy between the two women in which only one could be portrayed as a hero. And in relentlessly typecasting Lean as stereotypically feminine, the magazine's execu executives served to undercut the social and cultural significance attached to Lean's stories, which could have been shared with readers. 
Lane was also quickly typecast as Life's resident animal photographer, being referred to in the magazine as Batwoman and a snake charmer with a camera. Though aside from her first ever life story on turtles at the Bronx Zoo, Lane's animal-related assignments were largely amusing and entertaining stories during the first half of her career, rather than serious studies of wild species which she had expressed a keen desire to pursue. Between 1940 and 1955, 15 of her 17 animal assignments depicted pets or domesticated animals, including an ongoing feature about her own dog, Lucky, and a 1944 story about Tommy Tucker, the celebrity squirrel. But in 1955, Lynn's Photographic output for life decreased dramatically in quantity, and although no indication exists as to whether this was Lean's choice or that of life's executives, this change in tempo provided the photographer with time to pursue more involved, research-based animal stories. Lean had to fight to create these stories, though. After approaching an unspecified editor with an idea to pursue a story about bats, Lean explained that, quote, they said no. If they would do a story, they would assign a science photographer to do it because I wouldn't be able to do it. She nonetheless began to photograph bats, relying on her own time and money to do so, resources that would have been far too scarce for the photographer a decade earlier. Some time after she began photographing her flying kittens, as she affectionately named them, another unidentified life editor learned of her ploy and asked to see the photographs. Not only was he impressed, but he agreed to publish the story. When managing editor George Hunt penned his editor's note, Discovering the Beauty of Bats, which was featured in Life's Table of Contents on March 29, 1968, he failed to mention the magazine's initial skepticism about Lean's ability to create the story, instead describing the technical challenges faced by the photographer. He wrote, for the last picture in the essay, Dr. Jerry Winkler of the Public Health Service taped her into a special jumpsuit to protect her from falling mites and bugs and led her underground. The resulting photographs paused time for life's readers, allowing them to examine the rapid motions and subtle gestures of an animal that typically flickers out of sight in the blink of an eye. As effortless as they may appear today, these photographs were difficult to create in the 1960s. And in order to photograph bats, Lean employed techniques learned through workshops held by the magazine, including a three-day camera clinic in 1947 on the use of stroboscopic light. In an internal newsletter, Life's editors explained the clinic would be useful for shooting fashion shows. However, Lean chose to put her skills to use in animal studies instead. She also had equipment customized for her, sitting down with the maker of the Hulcher camera and its designers, to develop a camera that would take 20 exposures in one second with synchroni while synchronized to strobe lights. Considering also that according to Life's executives, quote, there was less known about the behavior of bats at that time than about the moon, this project was no easy undertaking. But rather than submit to the complications involved with photographing bats, Lean prevailed by producing images that were simultaneously visually engaging and scientifically illuminating. A July 1969 newsletter addressed to Life staff described Lean's bat essay as her finest one to date. The story prompted an exhibition of her bat photography at the Bronx Zoo and the World of Bats, a large diagram and image-heavy textbook-style publication. The strange world of bats signified the pinnacle of Nina Lean's foray into animal photography and photojournalism. Lean waited patiently for over 15 years between arriving in America in 1939 and creating in-depth in photographic studies of animals. Her photographs first appeared in life in 1940, and yet her first serious animal story would not be published until 1956. While the photographer's relationship with Life magazine was ultimately symbiotic, with Life offering Lean financial independence soon after emigrating from Europe, and Lean contributing to the success of the magazine, Lean's gender influenced the trajectory of her career as a photojournalist through the treatment of her public persona by magazine executives, the nature of the stories assigned to her, and the degree of tenacity required in order to pursue stories of interest to herself. Professionals working to legitimate the field of photojournalist have placed socially engaged images on a pedestal, 
inevitably shrouding the multitudes of middle-brow images that Lean created and that served to fill a considerable proportion of Life magazine's pages. Despite Lean's untoward treatment by Life's executives and her ensuing exclusion from the histories of photojournalism, her work so serves as a prime example of photojournalism that extends beyond hard news and expands the typical understanding of the genre. Women photojournalists may have benefited from working at, quote, the place for a magazine photographer to be published. However, the story of Lean's career at Life was one of resilience and subversion. She was forced to artfully navigate a male-oriented industry in order to thrive. Thank you.